to talk to you about why I think that every school should have a maker space. This is a location where teachers and students can go and use shared resources and tools to make things. I really think that schools should focus on teaching kids to become makers because makers can change the world however they want just by designing and making the world that they want to see. Uh, I'll start, start by talking about Green Fab. This was a program for students from the Bronx Guild High School. It was a collaboration between Vision Education, NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program, Sustainable South Bronx, and the Big Picture Learning Network. Um, we aim to teach uh, computer programming and electrical engineering and design through classes on green, green technologies and sustainable design. This is one of our students, Karen. Um, she is very proudly showing off a prototype for this device that she invented. This is a very early prototype. When she puts her hands into this box, these fans automatically turn on to dry her nails. <laughs> so Green Fab uh, was a, it was a one-year program, primarily for freshmen and sophomores. Um, it was, we, that we had a two-hour class in the morning and then an open lab period in the afternoon uh, for 10 hours per week. And uh, at the end of each semester, they had to build a final project that, that addressed some env cons environmental concern that they had about their community. So some students chose to define community as very local, like Karen just didn't want to get nail polish on her things. But um, some students define their uh, community as quite broad. So this is Victor. Victor, right after the earthquake in Haiti, he designed this mold for making bricks from dirt and grass because he wanted to explore alternative construction methods that could be implemented in the third world. Three of our students set out to test the effectiveness of green roofs and cooling buildings in the summertime. So they built this scale model, and then they inserted temperature sensors in the top and the bottom to track their data over time. So a really popular project for our students was when we made solar-powered charging devices. You can buy a kit from Adafruit here in New York City and solder one together yourself. So this is uh, Aaron, and he's showing off one that he housed in an old candy tin. So the sun charges his batteries, which charges PSP. This project was a collaboration between all the students in the program. It's an aquaponics ecosystem. It grows food using fish waste. So this is a, a window farm project. You can learn about it by looking up window farms, windowfarms.org. This, uh, this is Nestor. He's tending the farm. Um, Nestor was one of our shyest students. But here he is at, Ma at Maker Fair. Uh, he's just, this is him beaming after showing off his, uh, this is a prototype for a park table that charges any USB device. So uh, since I've I worked on that project, um, in the years since, I've uh, started another makerspace at the Marymount School in New York. Uh, bef but before I talk about that, I want to talk about another makerspace I work with. And um, this is what happens every Friday or every other Friday after teaching eight classes. It's a completely full day. I get on a train for Larchmont, New York. And in Larchmont, I go and meet 13 boys in a basement. Um, and we've set up a makeshift makerspace. So we have uh, on two collapsible tables, we've got uh, laptops, soldering irons, microcontrollers, wires. And uh, basically, we teach these kids um, to solve the world's most intractable problems. So, Andrew here is trying to make uh, a device that will automatically feed his dog and then log the time whenever his dog eats. <laughs> Peter is trying to make his clothes play music. So here, here he is uh, learning how to solder by putting together an AM radio from a kit. Uh, Lucas really wants to make his own custom video game controller. So here he is soldering one together from some parts he ordered from sparkfun.com. Uh, and Ian wants to figure out how to make his Nerf gun fire autonomously so that any intruders to his room will get thwapped by a Nerf dart. Um, so this, this group in Larchmont started when we met this young man, Andrew, at Maker Faire um, this past September. So uh, Andrew's mother came to us after the event and said that she really, well, first, I should tell you, we, we helped this, this young man start together his own little computer at a booth for an educational t cooperative that I'm a member of called Tink. And he, his mother came to us afterward and said, you know, I really want my, encourage my son's making and hacking. He's very enthusiastic about it, but I don't know how. And um, he goes to great schools, but they don't have an opportunity in the schools to teach these kids how to hack or repurpose electronics. So we said, well, that's fine. If you can find a, a group of parents, like-minded students, we would come up to Larchmont um, and, and help them work on projects that they wanted to work on. 
So you can read all about Andrew's system that he was displaying at Maker Faire as a home alarm system in a dollhouse. Uh, you can read all about it on page 59 of the latest Make magazine. So one thing that I've noticed, uh, I should say that that Larchmont group is the eighth group that we've set up in community centers, museums, homes, basements, and schools around New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, Westchester. So through this experience, um, I've really learned that kids really do like to make things. And it's, making is inherently pleasurable, right? So when you're making something, you have clear goals. Um, you've got a specific set of things that you've got to accomplish. Um, when, you're, when you're making something, you're intrinsically motivated to manifest and test your own ideas about the world behind, around you. And then uh, if the challenges of making something start to match the skills of the maker, this starts to take on the hallmarks of the flow experiences that Mihaly, Chick Sam Mihaly, talks about in his research on optimal experiences. Um, so we all know that students, uh, well, I've actually seen this flow on many of my students' faces, and I felt it myself, and I'm sure that many of you have too. So we all know that students learn more by making and breaking things than by sitting in front of a lecture pretending to listen, right? So why don't we design schools that encourage kids to make things? Or why don't we design classrooms that are more like maker spaces? Uh, and we're creating a, a culture of tinkering, making, and hacking throughout the school. So this is a, play, a laboratory where girls can come and design stuff on a computer and then manufacture, we have machines that can manufacture it there. So this is the first day of class back in September and these are eighth graders. They're just learning how to prototype circuits using breadboards and LEDs and wires. Well now these very same girls are building a maker bot. So what if every school taught their kids how to hack things? What if, what if every school had a maker space? Well, maybe then we could just do real-world design challenges all day, right? Or uh, maybe, maybe we could even just get rid of classes entirely and just do real-world uh, design challenges all day. So I think that schools can get rid of classes entirely and just focus on doing real-world design challenges because it's, making a design is like the mul ultimate multidisciplinary uh, exercise, right? So, Ask any designer or engineer, you've got you've to use research, reading, writing, arithmetic, problem solving, all these skills when you're designing or making anything. Um, making is not about the end product, right? It's about the process of getting there. Bree talked a lot about failure. Um, making teaches perseverance. There is, no, there is no real failure. There's only opportunities for growth. So when we're making something, whether we, our design succeeds or if it fails, we come out the other side better prepared to face an increasingly dynamic world. So I'm just an art teacher, or I'm sorry, I'm a technology teacher, so I can't cancel classes entirely and just do real world design challenges all day. I actually tried. But, um, <laughs> so I spend most of my time thinking about how to apply these principles to, design, to technology teaching. Um, so what I decide is I like to teach technology like it's an art class. And what I do is I just introduce the kids to a set of tools and then uh, I just let them sort of explore on their own, right? And I sort of help them as they need guidance. Um, so who's familiar? Everyone? Yes. OK. So my favorite scratch projects actually incorporate the Pico board. This is a circuit board that has sensors on it. And you plug it into a computer running scratch, and then you can trigger uh, real, world interact real world events to tr trigger interactions on a computer. So these are two students from the Marymount summer camp who are demonstrating their high five switch. So when they high five, it triggers the sound of a high five on a computer, which effectively amplifies the sound of their high five and augments their ability to express themselves. <laughs> so we teach, start teaching classes at Marymount in the Fab Lab in fifth grade. Uh, we use Tinkercad.com and our maker bots to teach the iterative design process. So this here is Vivian. She's taking measurements for uh, a modular storage system that she's building for her jewelry. So she realized, you know, she built, she, she designed this thing, she printed it out and realized that the measurements of her drawer were wrong. So here she is re retaking her measurements. And this is what Bree's talking about. It makes, it, failure is, it's no longer an option. It's not even in, on the table. You can just reprint it. Um, real quick, Tinkercad.com is excellent. 
uh, software. It's free, online web app. Uh, these are some of the things that some of my students are designing now. This is a uh, ionic column and a Corinthian column. Now, this looks easy. That's not easy, okay? This is fifth grade. Uh, it's a temple to Athena and then Iron Man. Um, so I'm going really quickly because I know we're short on time. Um, so in starting in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we use processing. It's an excellent programming language based on Java. Um, it allows students to create their own algorithmically generated art very quickly while learning concepts in object-oriented programming. So I was really excited on the day that I realized that they were switching out their Justin Bieber wallpaper for their processing <laughs> sketches. Um, this is the Arduino microcontroller. This, I love this thing. Uh, so this is a low-cost open source computer. Makes it really easy to uh, prototype your own digital inventions. So a couple weeks ago, I had a ninth grader, not one of my students, but an uh, upper school student came into the lab and she said, I have this idea for a device I want to make. Um, I need to know when my wa plants need water. So I said, you know what, we can find the plans for that. So we looked online. Within five minutes, we found the plans to make this device that turns on a light whenever her soil gets, whenever the soil uh, needs to be watered. So within five minutes of finding and then maybe half an hour of her building and learning how this thing worked, she had actually prototyped her own digital invention. Um, this is what I really love about this stuff. This is what really gets me jazzed because uh, these, these tools like Scratch, Arduino processing, make it really quick and easy for anyone, especially kids, to go from complete beginner to inventing and making their own art uh, very quickly. So as a technology teacher, I really have a lot of flexibility in the tools I choose to teach um, but I really like to use tools that, that, encourage, that make it easy for kids to express themselves by making them, their own art or inventions. Um, so computers by themselves are actually quite boring, I think. It's really the inputs and the outputs, the peripheral devices, that give computers their true power. So the students at our school love the laser cutter for uh, cutting out signs like these ones, um, or etching things, or just making all sorts of stuff. So uh, then if there's any device that they like, uh, if there's any device that they like more than the laser cutter, it's got to be the MakerBots. Um, again, Bree talked about them, so I'm not going to spend too much time. But these are um, some kindergartners that came to visit our lab. And you can just see their minds getting blown <laughs> in real time right here. OK. So um, these tools these tools really do empower girls with technology. It allows them to create with technology rather than just use technology. Um, I love what Bree said earlier about the superpower thing, because this is why I tell my students. I say, the easiest way to gain superpowers is to learn how to use these tools. Um, so I hear this argument against this stuff. I hear sometimes I have heard people tell me, you know, these fabrication labs are so expensive. Schools can't afford them. Well, you know what? For the cost of one smart board installation, you can get a MakerBot, a desktop laser cutter, and a CNC milling machine. And Scratch, Processing, Tinkercad, all free. And Arduino and all the associated components are so low cost. So the argument falls apart, all right? <laughs> all right, so just. I, I, I do want to end by reflecting on my own childhood and let you know why I'm doing this. Because um, I was a really, really poor student when I was growing up. And uh, I w I was, now that I'm a teacher, I realize I was one of those kids that teachers always talk about in teacher meetings. Because <laughs> I never did my schoolwork. And I, I, I would play, play sick because I was so scared of getting yelled at for not doing my homework. Um, but uh, why, why am I telling you this? Well, because. <laughs> Well, doctors gave me, like, they tested me, and they said, oh, he's got attention deficit disorder. And, and then uh, they, they put me on medication. And what I realize now is, like, the problem isn't necessarily with me. I mean, yeah, sure, some of it, probably. <laughs> but I think a lot of the problem lays on the schools, right? So um, my parents used to ask me every night when I came home, they'd be like, what did you learn today? And I hated this question. Because uh, learning's not really something you do, right? What, how was I supposed to answer that question? I love you, mom and dad. I know you're watching. But how was I supposed to answer that question? Would well, they want to hear some fact for like a test, a fact I learned for a test I forgot about a week later? But I think 
maybe what we need to start asking our children is, what did you make today? All right? So when, um, I want you to think back to your maybe middle school or, or lower school and think about some of the facts that maybe you learned. And then maybe think about some of the, the, the things that you made. And what are you more proud of? What do you, you think is more important? So look how proud I was this day when I built this spaceship in the basement out of found materials. <laughs> um, I think school should be more like a maker or should, school should be more like a basement or a maker space. In fact, almost everything I, I learn about, I, almost everything I've learned about the world I learn in a basement or in a garage. Um, so when I was a kid, my favorite toy was a, a, a cord, a, a severed power cord for a lamp. And I used to electrocute various materials to test what the effects would be. <laughs> this, is, this is a really, really bad idea. It's completely unsafe. But it got, me, it got me really interested in electricity, right? And now I know how to send past electricity through a pickle to make it glow. So here I am demonstrating that effect for some Marymount summer campers. All right, real quick. Um, so, I think um, one thing that, that I've been really pleased about um, as, as I've been advocating for this in schools, I'm really happy to say that there is a huge groundswell of support for these ideas. I mean, we've got make O'Reilly Media, make, uh, there's so many people are helping out with this. Um, so what I've actually found is that parents, parents have a really, uh, a really uh, strong power to change their school. So, uh, well, Andrew's mother from Largemont is in the audience. Cecilia is here, and she has actually um, a, she's brought in the superintendent of schools from Largemont and Mamaroneck school districts, and they're actually looking at the that that Largemont makerspace as a as a model for a facility that that they may open in their schools. Um, and I I think that parents and adults should should be pr pressuring schools to change the way they teach, and because adults like making too. All right, this is uh, Sister Terzina. And some parents from the Marymount community learning how to solder at a recent uh, professional development workshop that we held. So just in closing, I want to say, please help me in encouraging this trend towards maker culture in schools. Because makers are a culture who, uh, they're truly empowered by technology. Makers do not rely on others to solve their problems. They roll up their sleeves and they solve problems themselves. So because makers have the ability to control their own future, my greatest hope is that engineers, artists, and designers will inherit and save the earth. So please join me in creating this culture of maker in schools. And as educators, let's all ask ourselves, what are we doing to encourage this culture of maker, make, making in schools? And as parents, let's all ask our kids, what did you make today? Thank you.